Good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, it's great that you can tune in uh, tonight. Uh, a warm welcome to you if you're a visitor, if you're not part of uh, the CHBC uh, congregation. It's great that you can tune in. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Nathan, and I'm one of the pastors here at the church. So it's just great that you can be with us to hear the Word of God. For those who are uh, part of this congregation, uh, here we are still online and uh, I ideally do miss seeing, seeing you all and being together and uh, you're constantly in my prayers, bringing you up before the Lord. And I hope you're doing well. It's been good to hear from some of you and I pray that may continue uh, for as, as long as we have a part uh, in this sense. Uh, but if you have your Bibles, we're going to jump back into John. We've only got three studies left. Uh, this will actually be my final uh, sermon on the series. So I'm actually quite grateful for God's providence that I landed on this passage. Uh, but before we jump into it, let's pray and we'll ask the Lord uh, for his gracious help. How Father, we uh, come before you and we uh, just thank you for this time, though we are apart we thank you that we can draw near to you in this way, uh, wherever we are. We thank you that uh, despite our circumstances of being apart, your word is unchanging and it is still life-giving. I pray that we would experience that life-giving power even, even tonight. Uh, I pray for your great help. I pray for clarity in what is said. And I pray for understanding for all those who are listening God, may we be confronted by your wonderful, glorious and timely truth. May you be with us tonight. I pray that Christ would be on display. May he be revealed. May we learn much from him. May we be all brought closely knit into him, even this evening we ask. And we commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever gotten to uh, the end of a movie or the end of a book and you hit that final page or the screen goes black and you're looking and you're just thinking, what was the point of all of that? What, what was the point of that? Or have you ever read or watched something and, and may have even enjoyed it and then afterwards you went to talk to someone about it and as you discuss it, you only find out that you completely missed uh, the main point of it. Well, movies and, and books, whatever, whatever you prefer, uh, they're made for certain reasons. They're created for reasons. They have different purposes, whether it is to inform you, whether it's to entertain you, uh, whether it's to really garner a following and to enlist people, uh, whether it's just anything, whether it's to critique. There's so many different reasons why. Well, here in the Gospel of John, John's been writing for 20 chapters now, and he's gone into some uh, great and amazing detail. But in case you miss the main point of everything that he has written, everything that he's laboring to do here, he wants, us to re he wants to remind us, and he wants to do it in two verses. Now, this is a wonderful thing that the Holy Spirit's preserved for us, because wouldn't you want to know after getting to the end of John, after going through all of this, wouldn't you want to know if you missed the main point of it all? And so he tells us uh, what the main point of it is. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to John chapter 20. We only have uh, two verses, but let's just read them. John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. He writes this, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Two verses to give us the point of all of this. So really, I've only got two points for us tonight uh, to consider. The first is that I want us to see John's first purpose is to convince us, to convince us. And we see that there, uh, verses 30 and the first part of 31, the purpose of this book is to convince us with evidence. But after these uh, long 20 chapters, they've been detailed 20 chapters, John says something very interesting here at the start. He, he basically says to us, I left some things out. 
I left a bunch of it out. Actually, I left lots of it out. And, and this is a surprising detail because uh, especially that his purpose for doing this is to convince and give evidence, and yet he's left heaps of things out. Now, when you read the Bible, have you, especially the New Testament, have you ever noticed or have you ever been puzzled by how small Jesus' biography is? We get four gospel records, four accounts of him. Now, when you pick up your Bible, it's roughly about this, this thick. But when you look at Jesus' life, a recount of his life, it's about this big. It's, it's not really that big at all. And so if you were to put the four accounts of Jesus' biography, if you were to put them side by side with a biography, for example, of our former prime minister, Malcolm Turnbull, he's just got a biography out. If you were to put Jesus' biography next to Malcolm Turnbull's and you look at them side by side, Jesus' biography would look like a footnote compared to what was written about Malcolm Turnbull. And and, and so have you ever noticed just how little has been documented about the life of the greatest figure in history? This was none other than the eternal son of God walking amongst men. I mean, the four gospels written about him, his little biography, you you could read it in one sitting, in one night, in a comfy chair. You could get through it. And yet this was the the figure that changed the course of history. John says, I left stuff out. In verse 30, I left stuff out. He left many things out. There's no mention, not a single parable. Nothing about Jesus' ethical teaching. There's no narrative recorded of Jesus' birth. It's all left out. But more surprising than all of these omissions is what John says he specifically left out. Look at verse 30. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. John recorded some, some of the miraculous signs, but much of it he left out, he says. This is a very important statement. I want you to think about it. We've all been in a situation where where we've wanted to convince someone about something, something that we're passionate about and we really want them to believe it. And so we we throw everything at them. But you've been in those situations where you're trying to convince someone, but you've got very little evidence. You've got very little proof. You're really trying to persuade them with crumbs here. Well, John says, I've already included chapters upon chapters of proof and evidence about who Jesus is, But there was so much more that I left out. I had so much more that got cut out. There was so much that I didn't include. And to get you an idea of this, right at the end of John's gospel, the very last words that he records in the final chapter, he says this, chapter 21, verse 25. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that could have been written. You see, if everything that Jesus actually did were written and you compared that to Malcolm Turnbull's biography or any biography for that, for that instance, Jesus did so much, all the libraries in the world couldn't contain what needed to be documented about what he had done. And so volumes upon volumes could have been written about Jesus' life, but they weren't. Why not? Why weren't they? Well, if John's purpose in writing this gospel account was designed to entertain us, then the volumes would have been written. If his purpose was to entertain us. Don't you notice that there's absolutely nothing mentioned about Jesus' appearance? How tall was he? What color hair did he have? What did he look like? What did his voice sound like? John leaves all of that out. There would have been, if John was designing to entertain us, then everything would have been documented about all of his comings and all of his goings. John would have written about what happened to Jesus' father, Joseph. What was Jesus' childhood years like? What were some of those relationships growing up like? John leaves all of that out because it's not the purpose of the book. What does it say here? 
Verse 31, but these signs were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. See, his purpose in writing isn't to entertain us. It's to give proof and evidence, an eyewitness record. Now, what did John especially want to record? What's he referring to here? He says here, the miraculous signs that were written. I left out many of his miraculous signs, but I included some of them. Now, what's the point of a sign today? A signpost, what's the point of it? Well, it's to identify something. You see it on the street, a sign on the street. You see it on a building. You see them in shopping centers. Their point is to identify. They're to point somewhere. They're to reveal something. And this is what how, how John labels Jesus' miracles as miraculous signs, as miraculous pointers. You see... We often read Jesus' miracles and, 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 and we look at them and we can read Jesus hearing, healing a paralyzed man and yet we can keep reading whilst drinking our coffee and move straight on. That wasn't normal back then. It's not normal today and it wasn't normal back then. When Jesus healed the man who was um, blind from birth, Jesus' opponents are, are, are questioning and attacking and, and are trying to uh, write it off as, as not significant. But the man gets up and he says, hey, in, in chapter 9, verse 32, nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind before. This was significant. These were signs. So, so the point here that John's getting at is these miracles were signs pointing to the identity of Jesus. Now, this might shock you, but the main point of Jesus' miracles wasn't the outcome for the, per- for the person. It, the main purpose wasn't that they could walk again or that they could see again. Yes, he had compassion. Yes, he loved them. Yes, he did that for them. But they were signs. They were to point to who he was. And John's saying here, there's more than enough proof written down what I've recorded for you to believe. And also, there's more than enough proof written down to condemn those who refuse to believe what's written. It's very important. The Holy Spirit through John is saying these signs have been written in this book and they're sufficient to make us believe in Jesus. Now, what are the signs referring to? The miraculous signs that have been written. What's John talking about here? Well, in John's gospel, remember he left out so much, but John gives us seven miraculous signs that he records in his gospel. Seven. Now, if you've been going through this series with us, you'll know all of these. But let me give us a, a quick recap of what he's doing here and how he's linking it. Seven, seven miraculous signs. The first one is in John chapter 2. And this is when Jesus takes six stone water jars and he turns them into wine at a wedding. Now, that's an incredible miracle. But look what it, notice what it says in verse 11 of that chapter after. It says, This, the first of his miraculous signs, he thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. See, that's the whole point of it. This was the first miraculous sign. John says the point of the signs, miraculous signs, so that you'll believe in him. And it says here, Jesus, with his sign, it revealed his glory and the disciples put their faith in him. That was the point of the miraculous sign and it achieved its goal. The second miraculous sign was, uh, the, the second one is in chapter 4, the um, the royal official's son who was healed. Now this child was so sick at the point of death and this man seeks out Jesus and the miraculous sign was that Jesus heals the boy. But he heals the boy not even going out to the house to meet him. He just tells the official, go back home, he'll be healed. When the official gets home, the boy's healed. And this is what it says in in, uh, verse 54 of chapter 4. This was the second miraculous sign that Jesus had performed. The official and all his household believed. That's the point. The miraculous sign revealing Jesus' glory and people putting their faith in him because of what they've seen about Jesus and learned who he is. The third miraculous sign is in chapter 
is in chapter 5. There is the man who'd been an invalid for 38 years and he's at the pool at Bethesda. Jesus heals this invalid. In one moment, he performs divine surgery, divine healing, divine rehab, all in a moment, and he's completely healed. The fourth miraculous sign is in chapter 6. Jesus takes five pieces of bread and two fish, and he feeds 5,000 men with it. That's not including women and children. He feeds up to 20,000 people from five pieces of bread and and two fish. He creates food, and it even says 12 baskets of food were collected afterwards, left over. It's incredible. And even that evening, as he leaves from there, it's, he's portrayed as walking on the raging sea. The, f- um, the fifth sign is in chapter 9. Jesus heals that man who was blind from birth. And what was the result of that miraculous sign? 9 verse 38. The ma- then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. There's the point. He sees the sign. Sees who Jesus is. He believes in Christ. The sixth miraculous sign is in John chapter 11, and it's the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus has been dead for four days. But before he raises Lazarus from the dead in front of everyone, Jesus says this out loud in front of everyone. Verse 41, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And what was the result of this, of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead? Verse 45, many who had seen what Jesus had done put their faith in him. This is the point of the miraculous signs that people would believe in Jesus. And there was one more sign, the seventh sign. Remember, there was many he didn't include, but the seventh sign, what was that? It was Jesus' own resurrection from the dead. Now, What makes that one of the miraculous signs? Why why is that included uh, there? Why is that considered? Well, the answer is is found actually back in John chapter 2. You remember Jesus walks into the temple and he's furious. He sees the temple, the place of worship and prayer to God. It's turned into a marketplace and Jesus creates a whip. He throws over all the tables where all the money is on display and he drives out possibly thousands of people from the temple and animals and he drives them out in an amazing display of power and authority. Well, the religious leaders see him and they confront him about this. They're angry about him doing this. And, they say, and it says in chapter 2, verse 18, they demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority for doing all of this? How dare you do this? What miraculous sign do you show us to prove your authority? Jesus replies in verse 19, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it again. Now, they mock him, obviously, because they say to him, the temple's taken 46 years to build. You're going you're gonna to rebuild it in three days. But then we get the insight. It says in verse 20, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remember what he said, and they believed the scripture and the words Jesus had spoken. The sign was fulfilled and they believed. This was the point. John says, I left out so much, but what I have included here, these seven signs, miraculous signs, they're enough to believe. They're enough to believe. He says, these are written, evidence enough so that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It is vitally important that you believe correctly who Jesus is. And John's given us these miraculous signs to prove it. See, we don't have a blind faith. Christians don't have some fairy tale faith. You just got to have faith. You just got to accept it as true. No, no, we have these eyewitness testimony of miraculous signs revealing his identity. Who is Jesus revealed as? What does it say? It says he is the Christ, the Son of God. This is showing us, me, you, we, we are not allowed to have our own personal interpretation of who Jesus is. Talk to people today, 
Who is Jesus to you? Well, he picks me up when I'm down. He's kind of like the friend who's always there. Even after all of those years, he just seems always to be there. Or he, he's, he, he's the one that I go to when I, when I just feel like I need to talk to someone and pray. And I feel like I can just talk to him about anything. There's just too much of that nonsense in the world today and in many churches today. He is the Christ, the Son of God. It's not open to personal and private interpretation. That's the purpose for this book, to know who he is. Now, it is to know that he's the Christ and the, and the Son of God. Firstly, the Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name. We always call him Jesus Christ. It's not his last name. Christ is the Greek word there for Messiah. Messiah is that Old Testament figure that was long foretold, the long promised one from God. He, he, was, he was prophesied as one who would come as a deliverer, who would bring justice, who would bring peace, who would gather the nations together, who would rule over them. When, when, when the Messiah, the Christ, comes, he would change history forever because he would have a kingdom that was eternal, an eternal dominion. Christ also means, Messiah also means anointed one. The one that God sets apart. The one that God specifically chooses for the task. He was a set apart one by God. Why, why is it especially important for Jews, for Jews to see that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah? Why? Why is it for them? Because all of the Old Testament pointed forward to Jesus, and he fulfilled all of it. All the functions, all the roles in the Old Testament are fulfilled in Jesus. Think about it. He fulfills the sacrifices. He is the Lamb of God. He fulfills the temple, the meeting place with God, because he is Emmanuel. He's God with us. We meet with him. He is the fulfillment of the high priest. He is the one who lives forever and intercedes for us. He is the fulfillment of the prophets. The prophets spoke the word of God. Jesus is, is called the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word became flesh. He's the revelation of God. He is the fulfillment of the kings. They were corrupt. They were, they were rulers who eventually died. When David was anointed as king, set apart by God, he was anointed with oil. When Christ was anointed by God, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove and he was set apart for the work. He is the replacement of the altar. All true worship is only acceptable through Jesus. He is the fulfillment of it all. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. In 2009, when I was able to go with the Bible college I was at, we were able to go to Israel. It was devastating when we were in Jerusalem. And, and we saw all those Jews lined up daily outside the, the remaining wall of the temple, that remaining wall there. And they're, they're praying and they're bowing towards it and they're crying out to God and they're chanting and they're pleading for God to finally send the Messiah, to finally, to finally bring him. It's been promised for so long. And John writes, he has come. He has come. Why is it so important for non-Jews, Australians, us, this world, not non-Jews, to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. Why? Our world is in turmoil. Our world, people are depressed. And the drug they're dependent upon is entertainment just to keep functioning. We're filled with fear and anxiety and worry. We have more guilt in this life than we can bear. Crime, vice, and immorality of every kind is rampant. Social structures have been destroyed. We cannot trust our authorities. The family home is broken down. 
Children have two dads or two mums, or children watch their parents separate and their mum or their dad have a different sexual partner every year. The world is in chaos, is in turmoil, and it's undeniably obvious that technology, education, and advancement have not fixed the problem. It has not. It has not made it go away. And so what does the world do? The world has looked to the government to fix it. And and what's going on? Riots, protests, petitions, fighting, all this calling upon the government to fix it. We expect our governments to bring peace to this world, to, to, make, to make things right, to make it a safe place. We expect our governments to fix the problem of sin. What the government cannot do, God has done for us in Jesus the Messiah. He has done it. He has achieved it. He is the Prince of Peace who has come into this world with healing in his wings to fix the great problem, the root of every problem, sin. And he's come to deal with it and take it away, to bring help and salvation. It's come. Salvation is here. John says, believe he's the Messiah. And secondly, believe he's the Son of God. God. You see, if Christ or if Messiah refers to his title of office, his role, as it were, then the title, the Son of God, it refers to his nature, his being, who this mysterious one, who this incredible one has been for all eternity. Before he appeared to us, he is the very Son of God. That's who came to earth. God's son. In John chapter 8, verse 23, Jesus says this, You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. You see, God didn't send us another descendant of Adam. He sent us the second person of the Trinity in the Godhead, his son, God the Son, the Son of God. He was God and that's why he accepted worship from people. As the son of God, he is eternal. In the previous verse, what Pastor Ian preached last week, Thomas sees the risen Jesus and he cries out, My Lord and my God. He is the son of God. You see, this clear teaching, the miraculous signs showing Jesus is the son of God, it absolutely destroys the teaching of Mormons, destroys the teaching of Jehovah's Witnesses. They teach that Jesus was a created being. It blows that up. This teaching here that Jesus is the son of God destroys the teaching of Islam. They teach that he is a prophet. That's not true. He's the son of God. The religious leaders wanted to kill him, it says, because he made himself equal with God. We must believe, John says, that he is the son of God. Do you, you who are listening, you who are watching in, do you believe that he is the Messiah, the son of God? You may call him many wonderful things. You may say many lovely things about him. And holding to be many beautiful things. But if you do not accept and believe what has been written about him, it is of no value to you. What you say of him is of no value. Alexander McLaren, he he writes this, let me quote him. Many an exceptional scholar who has studied the Bible all his life has missed the purpose for which this book was given. And many a poor old woman in her garret has found it. You who are listening, have you found it? Have you understood? You have a great responsibility that is now placed upon you to believe and accept what is written of Jesus, that he is the Christ, the Son of God. And this leads now to my second and final point. The second purpose of John's gospel is to save us. To save you. Look at verse 31. But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John wants the reader and listener 
to gain life in Jesus, he says. To know who he is, to accept it, and to gain life in his name. What's this life referring to when he says to gain life? What's that referring to? Well, firstly, it implies something. People, he's saying, need life. If it's needed, it means that people don't have it. And if people don't have it, it means that people are dead. We need life. We are dead, therefore. So he's teaching that we are dead. So you walk around, you're dead. I'm dead. This humanity is dead, he's saying. We are cut off from the life of God because of our sin. It separates us from God. We have no spiritual relationship with him. We cannot, we cannot draw near to him, and nor do we want to draw near to him. We're dead in our sins. We are mastered by them, controlled by them, and we have no spiritual life and relationship with God. Every, this also shows us that every path in our existence leads to death. The pursuit of success, it leads to death. The pursuit of wealth, it leads to death. The pursuit, pursuit of pleasures, it leads to death. Pursuit of happiness, all of it, it all leads to death. All roads don't lead to Rome. All lo- roads lead to hell. Jesus taught, broad is the way that leads to destruction. That's where everyone is heading. They're they're on death row, they're they're dead. Let me give some imagery to what John is teaching here. We are on death row. Now I want you to imagine that, being on death row. Your trial has already past the sentence has already been made you are guilty of treason you are guilty of murder you've been found guilty of theft you have been found guilty of fraud and the sentence for death has been pronounced upon you all that's left now is to walk the green mile the final hallway and you're walking it You're walking it and you're heading. And before you know it now, even now, they're strapping us, strapping you in to the electric chair. You see your name above the chair. You feel the straps around your wrists. And as you look out, you look and the viewing viewing room is full. Angels are watching. Everything is set. The switch is about to be flicked. And then all of a sudden, the phone in the room rings. And it's answered. And the voice says, stop, stop. This man has been um, cleared of all charges. He is no longer a dead man. That is a living man now. He is free to go. He has been granted life. That's the situation that John describes that is offered to everyone and that everyone should desire. Because they're on that death row. What's this life offered in Jesus? Well, that word life, there is so much wrapped in to that one word life. There's so much meaning in that one word life. It's referring to spiritual life. It's referring to eternal life. And everything that eternal life encompasses. Life refers to the forgiveness of every single one of our sins, past offenses, present offenses, and offenses that will occur in the future. All of it paid for. Life refers to reconciliation, peace with God. uh, Life refers to immortality, newness of life that will last forever. It refers to a new heart, a new nature planted within. It refers to receiving a new and living hope. That transcends the grave. That you may gain this life. How is it obtained? How is life obtained? Verse 31. Look how clear it is. That by believing you may have life in his name. By believing. How is life gained? How is this wonderful life gained? By believing in him. Now you read that and you edit it in your mind, don't you? You change it. Surely it says you gain life by doing what is right and living a good life. 
Surely it says the life of heaven must be obtained by doing this and doing that and making sure this happens. You want to achieve it, don't you? You want to obtain it. You want to earn it. Surely it must be dependent upon you. Surely you can achieve it and tick it off. God will have none of that. He will have absolutely none of that. This has always been the way that the world has sought sought this life. Every spiritual religion out there, you must do this. They will give you a set and a list of rules and requirements and they will point you in the way to go. Every generation is guilty of building the Tower of Babel to heaven. Men will insist on building to reach the heavens, but God will have none of it. He will have none of it. So can I say to you who are listening, if you are a Catholic or you who might be Baptist or any church goer who thinks and functions like a Catholic, look at the plain writing of the word of God. It says here that by believing you may have life in his name. Jesus says, whoever believes in me will pass from death to life. It also says, whoever believes in him will never perish, but have eternal life. It is by believing a person is saved and gains eternal life in a very moment that they put their faith in Jesus Christ. Believing is faith. It is to trust. It is to entrust yourself and put your confidence in another. It is to relinquish confidence in self. Say with the greatest religious man who ever achieved righteousness in this life. Say with Paul, I count all of my works, all of my efforts as rubbish for the sake of gaining Christ Jesus, my Lord. John, to all of us, John presents us, each one of us, as dead. But he presents Jesus as life, as the life giver. Jesus is presented before us as the tree of life. And we're called to come and believe in him. And he who believes on him eats of that fruit and they gain life. And they pass from, life to, from death to life. See, John, through his gospel, he has labored to show us there is only one Savior given to us. There is only one door to heaven. There is only one gate to pass through. There is only one hope in this life. There is only one sacrifice for sin. There is only one refuge to protect us from the eternal punishment of God. We have one gospel and one Savior, and it's Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing in him, we gain life. We gain life. Jesus puts it as bluntly as this. Unless you believe in me, you will die in your sins what he says nothing but Jesus can save so let me close let me close tonight what is it what is it what reason do you have to be hesitant or unwilling to come to Jesus to believe in him as Messiah as Savior and to believe in him as the Son of God your Lord what, what's, what's hindering you? Is, is he too far removed from you that you, you don't seem like he's near? Well, he who was God, he took on flesh and came to us to dwell with us. Has he not proven the depths of his love for us, for you? Has he not demonstrated that? He who was willing to be trampled by his father, So that we who are guilty criminals could walk free and be saved? Has he not proven his love? Is he not worthy? Is he not entitled to your entire submission? Don't you realize that archangels and demons fall before him in his presence? Is he not worthy? Does he not not come to you and does he not come to, to me Offering us relief from our greatest need? Understand, your greatest need is not a new car. Your greatest need is not to get married. 
Your greatest need is not a better government who will put things in place to make things better. Your greatest need might, might not even be sickness being healed, if that's you. It's not your greatest need to be delivered from that. What is our greatest need? It is the forgiveness of our sins, to be reconciled to the one who is angry with us and who has made us and who will judge us. Does he not come, come to us offering relief from that? Does he seem irrelevant to you? I mean, you're a 21st century person, right? You've got a busy life. You've got a lot to do. And Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, he's just a bit irrelevant and not fitting for my life at the moment. Or could there be anyone who is more relevant to you? Anyone. He comes. He dies for us. He lives among us to save us. But why is he even more relevant now? Because he's coming back again. And he's coming back again to judge the world. He's coming back and in one moment to wrap up history, all trade, all buying, all doing, all working, all recreation, it's going to cease in a moment. And he's going to come and wrap it up in one mighty display of power. And then... And then all of humanity will be summoned to his judgment throne. All of us will face judgment and there will be not a soul to stand with you, not a preacher by your side, not a wife, not a husband, not a friend. No one will be with you, just you and your maker. All children will watch and see and look on as their parents stand before the judgment throne. Parents will look on and watch as they see their children stare before the judgment throne, all will be made to stand before him. That's why he's relevant. That's why we should believe in him. And no one on that day will be able to say of me, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you show me Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah? Why didn't you do that? I'll say I did. I said I did, but you were unwilling. He offers and he presents here eternal life. John has written all of this, all of this for you and for me. Will you believe in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God? He offers life to every single one of us, even this very night. Let me pray. Our Father, we thank you so much. Thank you for what has been left for us. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it has been preserved for us. Lord, we have more proof. We have more evidence than we could ever need to see that Jesus is the sent one, the Messiah, the deliverer, and he is your very son, worthy of all praise. You have given us more than what we've needed. Lord, we have not seen Jesus with our eyes, but you yourself, Lord Jesus, you said, blessed are those who have not seen and believe. I pray that every single one listening or watching would take hold of eternal life, even now, even in this moment. We're dependent upon you for this. And we thank you that you have spoken to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, May the Lord bless you and may you know that life that is, is found in his name. Amen. Mm -hmm.